um, like any um, empire, the size of the empire um, <clears throat> require that you know good communication from the capital to different provinces. So the Romans um, had also created a um, network of roads. And um, so like the, like the aqueduct, these um, Roman roads also need to, um, to pass different topography, different landscape, and um, being maintained constantly to um, remain a control for the provinces and um, for the movement of army and you know postal system communication, the speed of Roman postal system was unmatched until the 19, 19th. Um, the increase in commerce heralded a long period of peaceful prosperity uh, in Rome's provinces. The heyday of the Roman Empire was in the second century. And uh, during the second century, Rome reached its largest uh, expansion and uh, without major wars. Um, and that is also the period when um, the greatest Roman architecture was constructed. And uh, the Roman roads were also marked with milestones and uh, some of them bridges um, are still in use today um, all over Europe um, from Greece to Spain from Cyprus in the south to England in the north and a lot of them now became a quite spectacular um, vision in a modern city where you find those, you know, enormous arches um, that were constructed 2000 years ago. Um, so this is kind of a good road system is common for all major empires. We will see that in the Qin and Han China. We will also see it in, for example, the Inca, um, empire in South America. Um, let's take a look at the heyday of Rome. Um, that was under Emperor Trajan in the early second century uh, CE. And um, um, each Roman emperor built forum in the city of Rome you know, usually named after the emperor. Um, before the imperial age, there were Republican, um, Republican forum. The forum is basically a square enclosed uh, space. And we introduced that uh, when we were looking at Pompeii. But in the capital Rome, um, that forum were constructed to strengthen the authority of the emperor, uh, especially during the imperial age when those forum were named after specific emperor. You know, um, Augustus did it, um, same as Claudius, Nero, and um, you know, Hadrian and Trajan. Trajan built the largest imperial forum. These forum were carved out of the dense chaotic fabric of, of, of Rome. Um, you know, Rome as a city was not planned. The city grew from a small village into a huge metropolitan. So the street were quite, um, you know, dis in disorder. But uh, um, these imperial forums imposed those good geometry, symmetry, axiality, on the kind of chaotic fabric um, of Rome. Um, a forum, imperial forum, often include markets, a temple, 
a basilica and also libraries. And the forum of Trajan has all that. Um, so this is the, the forum of, of Trajan. Um, it has a um, huge courtyard. That is the, um, the forum. And surrounding it, a marketplace and two exedras, um, you know, define a courtyard for smaller shops to, to open. And uh, the basilica, which is a administration building, is located in a way that um, the long side has the entrance, right? The long side is, is facing um, the major uh, forum, the square. And uh, entered uh, through the long side um, and the ac axis of the, um, of the basilica is perpend perpendicular to the main axis for the whole complex. The beginning of the Trajan's forum is a arch, a trifle arch. Um, and in the middle of the forum is a statue of Trajan. So passing the basilica, um, a small courtyard feature a monument called the Column of Trajan. It is a, um, a tall column with spiraling unrolling of um, narrative relief on it, glorifying Trajan's great achievement. Uh, and on either side, there are libraries. One is for Latin language, another for Greek language. So there are libraries. And then at the end of access is a temple of, of Trajan. So these kind of great emperors uh, in the second century were pretty much deified, um, you know, after, um, you know, they, they were um, kind of almost worshiped as, as God um, after, the, um, after their reign. Uh, for someone like Trajan. So um, Enrique's today, you know, it's all ruins. If you, you go to Rome, you see there is a huge sunken area um, at the heart of Rome, very close to um, Colosseum. And that is, that is the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, forum of Trajan. A reconstructed view of the Basilica uh, featuring masonry supporting walls and, and columns and a wooden um, ceiling. So Trajan's um, basilica uh, was, was, not, was not domed or um, vaulted. Rather, it used um, a flat kind of wooden roof. And um, um, the wall had a second story. Um, open with big windows so the light shed from the upper floor to illuminate the center of the basilica and then the aisles uh, surrounding it um, uh, are the, the areas uh, kind of more defined and uh, leading to uh, the neighboring. And um, this is the column of Trajan. Uh, this is the most complete monument survived today. And um, a vision uh, looking at the um, column of Trajan um, from the Basilica. And from there, um, all you can see is the uh, plinth, the base, and um, um, the column. Um, so you should, you need to kind of look up at the, um, at the column and the upper part was um, was was barely um, visible from from the ground. However, there is an internal spiraling um, staircase that allowed um, the emperor to climb all the way to the top and um, appear um, as a godlike uh, figure to address um, the 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 crowd. Um, so the um, 
the basilica the basilica itself um, was for uh, governmental purposes um, and um, um, but you know in combination with commercial space kind of administration space and worshiping space the uh, forum complex um, kind of connect all those different functionality and also um, kind of speak powerfully uh, to unify uh, the ruler with uh, divinity. Carved on the, on the column are images like this, featuring especially Trajan's conquest of the uh, Dacia area. Um, Dacia is in today's um, Romania and um, Bulgaria, you know, that, that region. Um, that, that part was added by Emperor Trajan. Um, so obviously, you know, we have seen this in Assyrian palaces in Mesopotamia, and we have also seen something like this in the decoration um, for the mortuary temple um, of the new kingdom, uh, Egyptian kings like Ramesses the second, the great. So it's kind of in the same military spirit. Um, victory was displayed in quite brutal way, showing the head of the captives. Tacitus, the famous Roman historian commented on Pax Romana, that is the Roman peace. He said they made a desert and call it peace. Um, it was through these kind of um, conquering wars that um, not only the territory um, for taxation were expanded um, that bring wealth to the entire empire, but also directly kind of those looted treasures were brought back to Rome and those, those money and those wealth um, contributed to the construction of monument like that, as well as those great bath complex, the Roman thermi, and those were also um, financed by these, you know, um, conquest. And um, um, the ruler, of course, uh, gained authority gained um, support from the Roman citizen and remained in power. And in exchange, he provided the, the, those good comfort life for their citizens. And um, the Roman monument of the Trifo Arch, um, you know, Trifo Arch really symbolized the Roman approach to architecture it is basically a Roman arch plus a pre-existing Greek order. Um, like here, the arch of Trajan and just one simple um, barrel vault and with the superimposed um, uh, ionic, ionic order. And uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned before that the Romans really take the order, the columns and capitals as pure decoration. And indeed, um, they perform no structural function uh, whatsoever. They are pure decoration. And uh, they are used pretty much like picture frame to separate different, um, different uh, pictorial uh, scenes uh, that glorify um, the empress their achievements. And these Roman art, triumphal arches were constructed specifically um, marking the uh, parading road um, that the, the Roman army um, returned um, from those conquests, war of conquest back to, to Rome and often bring those looted wealth um, during the procession, and that was pre precisely for, for that purposes. So it also symbolized how Rome was constructed and, um, you know, the um, 
as well as the, you know, their approach to architecture, Roman structure plus Greek decoration. Um, the Arch of Trajan were constructed not only in Rome, but also in provinces, like this one is in um, Benevento, which is in southern, southern, southern Italy, uh, quite far away from, from Rome, also named the Arch of Trajan. Well, during Trajan's time, most, uh, and before, <clears throat> most arches were constructed with just one uh, barrel vault, one arch. The Arch of Constantine, uh, from you know, 200 years later, um, has three arches, uh, three bay, three arches, and um, so these three arched um, trifle arch um, kind of created a unique problem in terms of the use of order. Um, for example, the arches are not consistent in height. So you need um, kind of order of different scale. So here we see a combination of um, two different scaled orders, like the um, the pediments, um, the um, I'm sorry, the uh, the entablature here was supported by a bigger order, but the side arch arch used kind of smaller order, um, the supporting from from below and uh, supported these kind of small arches. And uh, later architecture, especially um, during the um, Renaissance period, um, Renaissance architect would superimpose orders of different scale, use columns, um, smaller columns supporting the arch and bigger columns support the superimposed um, entablature and thus mixing those different orders, not only in terms of style, but also in terms of scale. And uh, um, the Roman set up a um, precedence for uh, such a mixture of different scales um, in the use of order. And here too, um, the rondelle carving uh, celebrate Constantine's um, conquest and his military victory. Um, and uh, there were scenes showing his army, um, you know, uh, conquering Jerusalem and, um, you know, brought the looted um, treasures um, during, the, during the procession. Now, let's take a look at the uh, <clears throat> a very important book um, in the history of Western architecture. You know, we have mentioned Vitruvius, uh, his name a couple times before uh, in the discussion of Greek architecture um, and uh, uh, in the discussion about the origin of architecture. So uh, those were all from his famous 10 books on architecture. This book is important because it is the only textual account of architecture by an architect to survive antiquity. Um, nothing survived that complete from the Greco-Roman period. The original book in Latin was not illustrated. All the illustrations were made by the Renaissance um, scholars and architect. Um, so Vitruvius was kind of neglected from about 500 CE to 1500 CE during the so-called medieval period. However, he was rediscovered just like the entire kind of classical um, world was rediscovered in the 15th century um, and late 14th century. Um, <clears throat> start, uh, start with the uh, uh, humanists. And um, so Renaissance architect and scholars start illustrating it. So all these illustrations are um, after the text. Um, <clears throat> the significance of this book um, is partially in that there was a very self-conscious separation of theory from practice. 
right? There's a systematic theoretical thinking in architecture that is indicated by, by this book. And it's, its significance, of course, is also strengthened by the later discourse of Western architecture because architectural theory from Renaissance onward is based on Vitruvius or is in dialogue with his ideas. <clears throat> so the first contribution <clears throat> in this book, to me, the most significant one, is to separate theory from practice. No one has raised this issue before. You know, architecture, you just do it. Um, and for those um, philosophers who casually commented or touch upon the issue of architecture, they were not specifically targeting architecture and they were not practicing architecture. So here we have someone who is a practicing architect and uh, try to theorize it and the subject is solely on architecture. So <clears throat> theory, actually our English word theory came from the Latin word Theoria, um, theo, you know, today we ha have another word that, that is called a theology, right? Um, have you ever thought about, you know, why theory and theology share the same, same Latin roots? Because they were all about God. In the beginning, theory is uh, related to the Greek word um, about divine being. Uh, it re referred to a person participating in a sacred ritual or looking at God. So originally theory is about, about God. It is not a counterpart to practice. Right? So it is someone like Vitruvius that for, for the first time put theory as an opposite to practice and thus theory acquired new meaning. It is something that provide guidance, provide rational thinking about practice. So that is theory. It is no longer solely dedicated to divine being. It is not just about God anymore. It is more related to our practice in this world. Um, <clears throat> So the meaning of theory starts to change when it is, you know, juxtaposed to, to practice. So later, after that, its meaning is more about a self-reflexive activity in which the principles guiding the work are rendered in, intelligible. So it's not necessarily trying to interpret God to observe what, what God is, is um, demanding. So Vitruvius, he separated these two. That is really significant. And uh, certainly our mind, the way we think about theory and practice is a direct result of these, our predecessors, our ancestors who had you know, come up with these ideas and creating these concepts and that became part of our mental framework, right? So the way we think had a history, you know, our, our way of thinking come from, and this is one of them. <clears throat> so on the other hand, practice is the con continuous and regular exercise of employment where manual work is done with necessary material according to the design um, of a drawing. So practice carry out um, to some extent theory. Um, so I think that's the, uh, the first uh, significance. It made the foundation, made the foundation um, about, about theoretical thinking in architecture basically. Theoretical thinking simply didn't exist when someone before someone start to invent such concept. 
Another significant contrib contribution in Vitruvius 10 books is he set up standard for good architecture. This is the famous trinity of Fermitas, Utilitas, and Venustas, right? Fermitas um, can be translated as firmness, strength, durability, utilitas, commodity, convenience, um, venustus, um, delight, beauty, and grace. So let me give you an example. For me, it's about durability. You know, a building, a good building, has to be able to stand for a long time. That has more to do with civil engineering, has more to do with structural engineering, right? Say if a building collapsed, you know, one year after its construction, it does not have good formitas. That's very easy to understand. What is utilitas? Utilitas has more to do with the architectural plan, the plan of space. You know, say you design, you designed a, um, you know, a home, for example, where, you know, the, you know, the kitchen, for example, the kitchen and the dining room are on the two different end of the house, you know, where you need to pass a series of buildings past the, the, uh, the guest hall and past the living room, past the bedroom in, uh, and to reach your dining room. Well, that building might be able to stand for a thousand years, but it is not easy to use. Um, and uh, no one wants to walk long distance from the kitchen to a dining room to bring uh, your dishes to the dining table, right? So that is utilitas. So utilitas has something to do with the function. So a building needs to function very well. And so that different functions were separated, the quiet area, the kind of ceremonial busy area, they shouldn't be uh, messed up. So that is utilitas. And venustus, of course, that easy to understand is, is beauty. And when Vitruvius said that, he was pretty much thinking about a Greek order. Um, for Vitruvius, you know, our architecture to be beautiful, you need to have column, you need to have those beautiful kind of Greek details. But today, of course, we can expand that to include any kind of formal consideration um, and uh, aesthetic consideration, good proportion and um, decent, um, you know, texture and surface, and it, et cetera, right? So basically, um, you know, stability, convenience, and beauty. That's the three, um, three standard. And those standards are pretty much still uh, the way we think about architecture. We first require the fundamental thing for architecture is that it, sh it should um, structurally sound. And secondly, it, is, it should be uh, easy to use. Um, and third, it shouldn't be too ugly. Right? So that's still, still our standard. And of course, um, you know, Vitruvius went on and on to talk about um, all of them. And uh, his discussion on Venustus, on beauty, for example, is interesting. He talked about order, he talked about disposition. And um, he also talked about uh, eurythmy and talk about symmetry, decorum, distribution. Not all of, the, uh, all of them are uh, formal or fall into our kind of um, category about beauty. For example, when he talk about decorum, he's um, more discussing um, propriety. That is, you know, a building needs to be designed according to the status of the owner, of the master, right? Um, so in another word, um, you know, a residence for a certain people um, shouldn't exceed their um, social stand. And when he talked about the symmetry, he was really talking about the relation of parts to, to whole, um, etc. 
and he also um, emphasized the numerical um, harmony in architecture. Uh, so that one will be picked up by the Renaissance architect to highlight the ratio, good ratio. And uh, arrangement um, of, of the building. Um, and he also talked about uh, economical issue um, in his discussion on Venustus. So it does not kind of coincide with our kind of aesthetic association with the word beauty. Um, so for Vitruvius, beauty has many more aspect. It should be, it shouldn't be wasteful. Uh, on one hand, it should be appropriate. Um, and then it should be in good order. Uh, that is his idea about, about Venustus. And we, Vitruvius also initiate the idea about harmony. And for him, harmony come from, you know, um, those ideal number, those good proportion. And he also made an argument that our human body um, is a beautiful thing. So this is quite, um, quite an idea inherited from the Greeks. The Greeks appreciate human body, especially those uh, healthy and uh, youthful um, athletic um, body, those athletes in competition. That was um, those featured in Greek sculpture. So Vitruvius inherited that. And, uh, but he made an argument that, you know, human proportion, the beautiful human proportion is also based on those good um, number, the proportion that employ whole numbers. And a Renaissance um, architect and, and, and artist made illustration to demonstrate those good proportion. And that was already embodied in the human body. What's more, Vitruvius also argued that those good ratio is not only for architecture, it's universal. He argued that music, for example, is also based on the same kind of numerical harmony. Um, those create good concourse. Um, that is, you know, the course in, in, in harmony. And he argued that the fourth, the fifth, the octave, and then an octave plus the fourth and fifth, um, and double octave, those are beautiful harmony. Um, and indeed, um, they are. The kind of classical music, um, you know, as late as the 19th century, were still pretty much based on that theory of harmony um, about, you know, what is the stable chord, what is unstable note. So um, his theory is, is famously illustrated by Renaissance um, artists like Leonardo da Vinci that argued the human body prescribe a square and a circle and at the center is the navel. Um, so, you know, when you review the video, you can read those carefully. That's basically he, his, his argument and that is trying to um, give this kind of geometry a theoretical um, foundation. And it is interesting to see the difference while in some other tradition, like in traditional Chinese architecture, square and circle were also considered as, as the ideal form. But uh, the, the theory about that is very different um, for the Chinese square and circle are perfect and universal because the heaven is square and uh, the heaven is circle and the earth is square. Um, that, you know, that's what the ancient Chinese believe. So they use square and circle in the construction of their sacred architecture to communicate with heaven. Um, and that, that's based on the divine cosmological um, order. While Vitruvius um, and Roman architecture also adopt square and heaven for the construction of their sacred building, but the theory is uh, humanistic, that is based on human. Um, that is a reason why after the um, so-called dark age of, 
of the Middle Ages from 500 to 1500, the Renaissance uh, humanists, they would um, raise the banner of the you know, classical authors like Vitruvius to make a claim of their humanistic um, value uh, to, to some extent, fight against the rigid sticking to the value as embodied in the Bible. So there is a certainly a very humanistic aspect in uh, Vitruvius architectural um, theory. So that uh, could be observed in the best preserved and the greatest, one of the greatest Roman buildings survived today, and that is the Pantheon. So we are going to look at this building in some detail. This is also built in the um, second century during the heyday of the Roman Empire. Um, Hadrian was the successor to Trajan. Um, the Pantheon constructed by um, Hadrian was a reconstruction of a pre-existing uh, building. Um, the pre-existing building was, um, was dedicated to Marcus Agrippa and uh, some also believe you know, he was the sponsor of that. And um, you know, uh, more than a hundred years later, um, Hadrian um, rebuilt it into a pure masonry building. Agrippa's building might be, um, you know, the timber roofed, um, but here Hadrian uh, created a pure masonry building using stone and, uh, and concrete. So uh, constructed from 118 to 126, um, that, is, that is a slow speed for Roman construction, but fast compared to the Greeks, right? Um, thanks to the availability of concrete, the volcanic ash, um, the concrete, the Roman construction was very fast. Usually, you know, it does not take um, that long, 80 years for the construction of a building of this size. The size of Pantheon was not um, super big compared to some of the, um, you know, thermi, the bath, um, for example, the the thermi of Caracalla or Diocletian. Um, but uh, it took 80 years. Um, that's pretty fast compared to the Greek temple, but compared to some other Roman structure, it is, it is not, not that fast. So a lot of care, a lot of um, uh, consideration went into the building. So it took a longer time than, than usual um, in the Roman standard. The building itself, known as Pantheon, is basically a temple, but instead of like the Greeks in the Greek uh, tradition, each temple was dedicated to a specific god. So you have the temple of Artemis or the temple of Athena, um, etc. and etc. temple of Zeus, temple of Hera. But uh, um, Pantheon, you know, this is dedicated to a variety of, of Roman, Roman God. Um, so it's called the Pantheon, um, as well as, um, as, well as uh, Emperor. Uh, <clears throat> for example, Emperor Trajan also had a place there. Um, so it was also used as the seat of Emperor for um, administering justice. Um, and uh, so it combined the function of basilica and a temple. So in the niches on the side, we have those statue of God. Um, during the medieval period, they were replaced with, um, you know, Virgin Mary and, and, and you know, apostle saint. Um, but during the Roman time, those statues were the gods and the deified empress. But the space underneath was used for administration. So it combined the function of basilica and the temple. That also, that is also a quite um, consistent feature in, you know, after Trajan, when the emperor was more kind of, especially those powerful emperors were more um, 
associated with, with, with God. The dome has a diameter of 43 meters, twice the span of previous largest dome constructed by the Romans. And until the mid 18th century, that was the largest spanning um, open space in the world. So that diameter was not surpassed until the 18th century. Today, you know, only um, the singular rotunda was standing there. But during the Roman time, um, the Romans was a big fan of building complex. Their individual structure were usually part of a big complex, as in the case of the Roman theater, you know, in contrast to the Greek uh, theater where different parts are individual buildings, while the Romans built buildings in complex, utilizing courtyards. So originally, Pantheon was fronted with a narrow rectangular pre-style, a peristyle um, court, court. So there is a courtyard with peristyle columns. And um, the layout display Roman architectural preference for geometry uh, defined uh, enclosing um, enclosed spaces. So it highlights that axiality. So um, it, it used to be the end of a long axis, starting from the gate, passing through an arch, and then end up at the, uh, the rotunda, Pantheon rotunda. So the building was viewed very differently from the Greek temple. When we talk about Greek temple, um, like the Parthenon, the Greek Parthenon was meant to be looked from any direction, right? It's surrounded by empty space. But here, the rotunda of Pantheon was only to be appreciated from the front. So as a result, its design is mainly, the exterior design is mainly on that facade facing the courtyard. The other parts were not meant to be visible because um, it was surrounded by a very narrow alley and those low houses, um, kind of chaotic small alleys in the neighborhood, um, there's not enough distance to appreciate the other part of the wall, um, as well as a dome. The dome was not meant to be visible at all. It's not visible uh, in the city. So when you are standing on the ground, that dome was hidden. I think that is um, very important to, to notice. Um, it's, designed in a very different, um, different anticipation for being looked at, right? And um, that, you know, um, brings, you know, my former argument about, you know, Greek architecture is a giant sculpture that was meant to be looked at from many different angles. It's like a beautifully carved marble box to be looked at from different angle, while Roman architecture was not. Roman architecture, their beautiful side was a face, facing a space that was meant to be looked straight upon because the space was, was controlled and it was also confined that only allow you to see part of the exterior, not, not everywhere. Um, but the greatest achievement of Roman architecture in general and uh, Pantheon in specific is the interior, right? The Greeks had never achieved such a large interior space. Uh, but here, a huge, enormous circular interior space was, was created. While the exterior wall was not decorated, not meant to be appreciated, it is the interior wall the ceiling, the floor, that was the focus of the design. So Roman architecture highlight, strengthen the interior. And that interior was not only about surface decoration, but also about spatial contrast. <laughs> For example, in order to enter the huge uh, interior space, one pass through a portal 
which is basically a Greek temple front. So this is pretty much like a, a Greek temple. Um, could be understood as a double peristyle, uh, like in the, um, in the Ionic order in Greek architecture, um, where the ceiling is low, no light, and pretty dark. So after you pass through that narrow and small space, and uh, suddenly in front of this, you know, under this enormous dome, um, and within this beautifully decorated large interior space, um, you know, you, you are wowed um, for that experience. And that transition is crucial because imagine if you are directly stepping into a domed interior space from under the dome of heaven, no matter how big that dome is, you won't feel that's, that's very big because the sky is always bigger than any human construction, right? So that spatial contrast, first to go through something dark and narrow and then show you that space and that contrast would create a real appreciation of the size and grandeur of that human construction. Um, that spatial contrast, you know, like music, um, you, you want to make the big bang at the end of a symphony, um, you, you need to have some really whispering sound before that. And then allow people to appreciate that loudness, that power, and that is pretty much brought out by, um, by contrast, by the usage of contrast. Like the sound, like in music, in architecture, that spatial contrast was an efficient way to, um, to you know, compose um, those spatial experiences. Uh, the rotunda has a open space, an oculus in the middle, no roof at all. There is no lantern pavilion. It's just open. So during a rainy day, um, water collect on the floor, which is which is which is okay. Um, it's not not that bad. I visited it during a you know drizzling day, um, so you can feel the water dropping from the from the ceiling, um, which, is, which is very unique. Uh, <clears throat> um, but my point here is um, the light from that hole shed on the different part of the ceiling and the wall. And the ceiling had those um, grid that can be compared to the meridians and uh, longitudes, lat latitudes, um, when we draw a map. So it's created a coordinating grid so that the position of that light could be measured. <clears throat> and in different season, it cast at a different place during the same time of the day. And in the same day, during different time, it circulate around the ceiling. In another word, this is also a giant clock. Um, like, you know, when we were looking at the Neolithic architecture, we talk about the monolithic mania. Um, it is basically a sundial. So here, um, it's also basically a sundial, right? So it gives you a sense of timing um, and those grid helped to locate those, um, the light um, and help you to understand the passing of time. Vitruvius book, 10 books, interestingly, assigned time pieces as part of the job of architect. In another word, you know, during Vitruvius time, 
architect also design clock and design those military equipments as well. Um, so ar architecture's definition was, was much bigger um, than say the Renaissance period, which might not be accidental um, for you know, something like that designed and happen. And Vitruvius also emphasized the geometry. So there is good geometry, good ratio in the design of Pantheon. Um, <clears throat> the height of Pantheon's interior, 150 Roman feet. And um, that is also the diameter of the dome. In another word, you can fit a perfect ball inside of the Pantheon, right? So there is a circle and a square right there in the section, a square and a circle. Uh, secondly, the relationship between the rotunda and the Greek temple. So um, it's basically a cylinder plus a square building. The cylinder is Roman structure and that square is a Greek decoration. And that square features a, a Greek temple front in the Corinthian order, which was meant to show the beauty of architecture. While that rotunda, a great engineering marvel hidden behind the beautiful, you know, in quotation mark, um, Greek temple is, is only to create a surface for an interior space. So we also find here, like what we find in the Trifle Arch, the Roman concept about architecture, about their concept of beautiful Greek, you know, um, you know, structural Roman and uh, what is to be seen, what is not to be seen. And very often the great revolutionary aspect were hidden behind a veneer of conservative order uh, from, the, from the previous period. So the Romans um, use good order, also use module. Um, so here, anything is times a five Roman foot. Right? Five Roman foot was used as a, um, a module. So this is the modular difference between Roman and Greeks. While the Greeks use a section of the architecture, but did not pin down its specific dimension. The Romans also used module, but the Roman module was a specific dimension. It's not necessarily the diameter of the column. It is a specific absolute dimension. So, um, so the height or diameter of the, um, of the dome is 150 and um, um, you know, the column is 30 and uh, from the capital to the cornice is 15 and then the attic height is 30. So that use, use five Roman feet as the module. Um, so, oh, another, another thing here, you know, there's a circle, there is a square, and then um, the length, the protruding length of the temple front is also governed by square, right? And it's an inscribed square duplicated to produce the Greek temple front, the size of the Greek temple front. So very geometric, circle and square, just like what Vitruvius said, the perfect shape, the most perfect shape based on human. Um, 
And um, as if the architect was worrying, spectator didn't get that idea on the floor, circle and square repeated. Uh, beautifully car a uh, beautifully uh, inlaid marble featuring square after circle after square after circle right? circle and square and that the gridded floor created axiality within a circular concentric building while the rotunda in plan has no axis, right? You know, for a circle, you can have axis anywhere. However, um, axiality was created in interior by manipulating the floor and the wall. The entrance and the opposite entrance has arch that interrupt the attic, while the other one all the other niches, they were all below, um, you know, the cornice of this, you know, um, order. So that specially treated end of entrance and, and the end created axiality. And that axiality was strengthened by the ground division into those grid that created a cross that, of course, has, has access. Different spot on the circle is no longer equal in status. These spots were highlighted. So these two are the first rank, and these are the second rank, and these are the third rank spot. And these are, you know, the fourth rank. So a hierarchy was created on a circular uh, surface um, with the um, wall decoration as well as the floor decoration. Um, there is a <clears throat> misalignment, you know, I use the word misalignment um, in quotation mark because it might be a deliberate design um, between the domical ceiling and the structure, uh, the cylindrical wall. <coughs> um, for example, the coffer in the dome, we call this sunken area coffer, into five rows and 28 meridians. Uh, 28 of them. <coughs> this 28 the, the numbers all have symbolic meaning. Five rows represent the five known planets. And the 28 meridians refer to the lunar cycle, which is 28 days. It also um, uh, is the uh, perfect Pythagorean number, which is the sum of one to seven. Um, that equals 28. So there are numerical, scientifically based kind of numerical symbolism. The wall, on the other hand, is divided into 16. Because we mentioned, you know, the wall and the floor um, highlight 2, 4, 8, and 16, right? The two end, and then the four card cardinal point, and then the eight, you know, and then 16, it's divided that way. So the ceilings were divided into 28 sections and the wall are divided into 16 sections. So they do not align perfectly. They do not align perfectly. For example, at some places they align perfectly. On the four cardinal point, they align perfect, perfectly because both 28 and 16 can be divided by four. But other than that, they do not align. So this is the entrance, this is the end, and they align perfectly. So we have this open space aligned with the coffer, um, which, is, which is good because coffer is thinner 
and um, um, the arch is empty. So you have those light section lined up. That's, that's perfect. And then um, at the middle spot, uh, same alignment was created, right? These are the kind of car cardinal location. The niche aligned with coffer. And then at one eighth section of the, um, of the circle, the coffer, the empty space lined up with the thickest area in the dome. This is the rib, right? Um, so you have a heavy part located on an empty space, um, which is not ideal, but the at least line up. Then at 16th, they do not line up with anything. So here we have that niche and uh, the axis does not line up with anything. So they do not perfectly line up. Why is that? <clears throat> is that an accident? Is that a sacri sacrifice of harmony for the sake of numerical sim symbolism? Um, some theorists, or theorists said no. They believe this is also a deliberate decoration. They believe that the misalignment creates a dynamic space since the dome appeared to rotate above the attic and column. If the coffer were divided into 16 or 32, the impression would have been static and contrary to the celestial motion of the planet. All right, according to this theory, the misalignment create an illusion of rotation. Uh, standing on the floor, you would feel that ceiling is rotating. If your eye trace that misalignment, you use one as a reference. It's like motion picture. Then you would feel, since they are all they look, all look the same, you will have an illusion as if the same thing is moving because it is related to the division underneath in a different way, right? So that's basically the theory about that mis misalignment. In addition to symbolism for the ceiling and a lower structure, it also was meant to create that more dynamic feeling for the ceiling. Whether or not you feel that way, um, you know, you have to, I don't give you the answer. You have to go to Rome and observe with your own eye. See if you feel it is rotating or not, right? Um, the coffer was designed in a way that if you stand high above there, they are not concentric. So this is the elevation. It's narrower on the upper part and thicker on the lower part. However, that was taken the consideration of someone standing on the floor and look at them. When you are standing on the floor, you feel it's perfectly concentric because the lower part were partially hidden because of the width of those layers. All right, so this is how those, they look when you are standing above and look straight on them. And this is a view when you are standing on the ground. So from the ground, you see them as perfectly concentric. But in reality, it is, it is not. You know, the upper part is much narrower than the lower part. So that could be considered as a refinement, all right, visual refinement. And uh, the last point I wanted to make is that Roman architecture, it's, it's a, an earlier argument that I made, was not meant to be appreciated as a giant sculpture. It's not meant to be appreciated from all different angles. Only this part was meant to be appreciated and de 
and thus embellished. Look at the other wall. It's basically, um, you know, just uh, after you dismantle the scaffolding, um, no embellishment at all. And uh, the dome, which looks quite prominent on the drawing, it is invisible. It is invisible. That dome was not meant to be appreciated as a beautiful part of the architectural image in the urban setting. So only that face, Greek face, was meant to be, to be, um, to be appreciated. And uh, the structural elements were exposed there, the thick wall, and also those niches were strengthened, those hollowed interior space were strengthened by the arch um, in the wall. And they are pure structural, that is not meant um, to be appreciated as part of the you know, beautiful architectural design as the Venustus. And that further indicated in the Roman mental architectural mentality, there is always a kind of a <coughs> beautiful Greek. And then um, somehow their innovation in engineering and a great achievement in the construction of large scale efficient space were not really um, appreciated as a kind of a, um, architectural marvel. It was considered purely utilitarian. And of, of course, today, we, we don't have that mentality anymore. Structural, structure is beautiful. And, um, and a structure should contribute uh, to, to beauty. Uh, beauty is not something added, superfluously added to, to a structure. I think that's the, uh, the last point I wanted to make in the uh, Roman architecture.